everyone. Thank you for joining us for Pediatric Grand Rounds. Uh, if you're in the building or anywhere close, uh, today our speaker is Dr. John Tuttle from the Department of Orthopedics. Dr. John Tuttle was born and raised in Columbus, Ohio, and received his BS degree from The Ohio State University with honors and distinction in molecular genetics. He went on to simultaneously receive his medical doctorate and his master's degree in applied anatomy from Case Western Reserve. He completed his orthopedic residency and trauma fellowship at Brown University, and he went on to complete another fellowship in sports medicine at Northwestern University, where he acquired subspecialty training with the team doctors of several professional teams in Chicago, including the Blackhawks, the Cubs, and the Bears. He manages a vast array of injuries with a surgical focus on minimal invasive uh, surgery of the shoulder, elbows, and knees. He is actively engaged in medical research, has published over two dozen journal articles and book chapters, and is a frequent lecturer for education and training. He's a member of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, Virginia Orthopedic Society, American Orthopedic Society of Sports Medicine, Orthopedic Trauma Association, and the Arthroscopy Association of North America. He holds academic appointments as a clinical lecturer of orthopedic surgery at the University of Virginia and assistant professor of surgery at BTC SOM. He serves as team physician for, for VMI, Southern Virginia University, Washington and Lee University, and Cape Spring High School. Go Cape Spring. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Tuttle. <laughs> Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Um, all right, so I am gonna try to make this talk as relevant to you all as I can. So if I'm spending too much time on something, just raise your hand and say move on. And uh, if there's something that I'm moving past that you say, no, 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 wait, that's like, that's really important, then please stop me. I'm very, uh, very easy going as far as that's concerned. So we're gonna cover everything that you could possibly wanna know about the ACL in about 50 minutes, okay? That's the goal. Um, what is the ACL? Well, it's one of four uh, of the major ligaments that stabilize the femur to the tibia at the knee joint. It's the primary stabilizer, prevents the tibia from sliding forward relative to the femur, <clears throat> and it protects the menisci from sharing forces. So if your ACL is not competent, then the next structure that starts to, to take that force is the posterior horn of the medial meniscus and then the lateral meniscus. So you can see these kind of act like bumpers there. And if that tibia is shifting forward, then that then those bumpers are gonna are gonna be at risk. And that's gonna come up later as we as we talk about these things. So all right, so I had to sprinkle in some multiple choice questions for uh, for your credit here. So why have ACL injuries in young athletes increased over the past two decades? Okay. Is it A growing number of children and adolescents participating in organized sports? B increased participation in high demand sports and intensive training regimens at an earlier age. Than they, than they used to, C, a greater rate of diagnosis due to awareness that ACL injuries can happen in younger children, and more frequent use of advanced imaging like MRI, or D, all of the above. All right, everybody saw through my tricks. So. That's true, so um, it's likely a combination of all of those things, but it, it is true, it, ACL injuries have increased significantly, especially in the younger populations, due to all of those reasons. <clears throat> so ACL injury rate in the general population is about one in 3,000. Uh, over 70% of those are, are sports related, okay? And the riskiest sports that involve jumping, landing, quick turning your direction, pivoting, like soccer, football, basketball, gymnastics, tend to be the, um, the, the biggest problems. I really like this graph, and you're gonna notice that I'm gonna use this uh, multiple times throughout the, the talk. But so, um, I really want to focus on this part of the graph, all right? And you'll notice that this number of, number of injuries is on the y-axis and the x-axis is uh, the age. And so we're starting at essentially uh, pre-adolescent and then that spike that happens in the teenage years. And then if you look at all risk of ACL injuries, uh, about five in 100,000 athletic exposures, which essentially essentially just means any time one of these athletes is engaging in uh, uh, athletics. So it could be a competition, could be practice, right? Could be, um, you know, it, anything related to their sport. Uh, and then it's almost three times that at, at the college level, okay? If 
females, they're about four to six times more likely to tear their ACL than males in similar sports, so soccer, for example, basketball. <clears throat> and they're less likely to return to sports after ACL injury. And this is a, this is a, uh, a hot topic in, in orthopedics right now, trying to hone in on um, why there's such a discrepancy. And so if we look at the big offenders here, girls' soccer uh, wins. It's the, the most likely uh, to lead to uh, an ACL injury. Boys football is close behind. And then girls basketball, girls gymnastics, boys lacrosse, girls lacrosse, boys soccer, boys wrestling. So it, and then you start to kind of fall off <clears throat> with uh, swimming and diving uh, you know, being pretty, pretty close to the end there. So if you think about what happens to these kids um, when they get an ACL injury, sure, there's the physical toll, right? You have to go through surgery, and then there's you know upwards of a year of, of rehab to try to get back to normal. There's also the social and academic side, right? So they miss whole seasons of play. Um, it might limit their future opportunities. It, they're, they're taking time out of not just sports, but they're taking time out of school. Sometimes they're getting behind. They're missing days of school. They can't focus. They're on narcotics for a few days, things like that, right? So there's, there are things that happen you know, beyond just, oh, I can't play soccer anymore. Um, and then they're, they're also not with their friends as much, right? They're not, they're not in their social circle, so there's, there can be this kind of negative um, psychology associated with it beyond just the physical toll. Uh, there's the financial, obviously, um, you know, that, um, that, that's, that's uh, variable, but it's, um, it's always a consideration. And then there's the long-term effects, right? So you think, well, you've got a new ACL and you're fine, you move on, but that's not necessarily true. Even if, you, you know, you treat this perfectly and you get to it before there's a lot of damage in the knee, they still have an increased risk of, of osteoarthritis uh, down the road as they get older, even with a perfect ACL reconstruction. So how is it injured? Well, it's usually injured with a twisting moment. We'll go over that, that uh, mechanism a little bit more carefully. But there are contact injuries, right, I mean, a football player there, um, and then there's non-contact. You know, skiing is a, is a pretty classic example. So it looks something like this. Watch your left leg, OK? So that's the, that's the, the position uh, where the ACL is at, at rest. All right, so here's your next question. Are the majority contact or non-contact? I'm talking about sports-related ACL ruptures. Man, you guys are good. All right. Seventy percent of injuries are non-contact. Okay, so there's something going on. If it was all contact, if you know, ninety percent of these were contact, and you would just say, well, you know, maybe we should change the rules of the game. Maybe you can't hit the knee, or maybe you can't fly tackle, or maybe you can't, you know, tackle at the, you know, whatever, right? But that's not the situation. Most of this is trying to decelerate, change of direction, right? And so there's something inherent to those athletes. Um, maybe it's bad luck in some instances, but maybe there's some things that we can, we can modify. And that's, that's another hot topic for us. So um, the most common position for the ACL injury, the hips internally rotate. So what I want you to focus on is uh, her right knee, okay? That's the one we're talking about. The knee's near full extension, the tibia is relatively externally rotated, the foot tends to be planted and everted, and the body's trying to decelerate to either stop or change direction, okay? Combination in that position leads to valgus collapse, right? So the knee is going to buckle inwards, and the foot is going to stay planted and go relatively lateral, okay? And that's where the ACL is at risk, okay? Can we predict an ACL tear? Do we know who is at risk? Well, the, the best prediction is prior in ACL injury, okay? You have up to a 15 times higher risk of another ACL injury if you've had one, okay? Female athletes are four times more likely to have a second ACL injury in either knee. They're six times more likely to suffer a new ACL injury in the contralateral side compared to their male counterparts. So the contralateral knee uh, ACL is at risk uh, twice as likely as the reconstructed ACL. So you've had it reconstructed, you're about six percent that you're going to re-tear it, you're almost 12 percent that you're going to tear the other side. So there's something going on, right, whether it's a genetic factor, anatomic, neuromuscular, probably some combination there that sets these, these athletes up for, for these injuries. And so let's delve into this a little bit more. So we know that ACL injury increases with age in both sexes. We remember that graph where 
they both start out pretty much at the same risk level. I'm going to show it again here in a little bit, but just try to picture that in your head. And then as they hit puberty, girls go sky high. Boys go up too, but girls go a lot higher. Um, so we know that girls have a higher rate of ACL tears following that growth spurt. The girls grow a little bit earlier, right? They hit that growth spurt maybe a couple of years sooner than boys a lot of times. But they take off. So they have an increase in body weight, an increase in height. Their bone length is increasing significantly during this stage. And so the tibia and femur, femur are growing at this rapid rate, right? So now you've got the two longest levers in the human body, and they meet at the knee, okay? So the knee is now seeding great, greater torque than it ever has in that person's life. They have increasing height, so their center of mass is now raised up, right? So it makes it harder to control their center of gravity. Their body weight's going up. So there's more force across that joint. It's more difficult to balance and dampen during those high-velocity movements. It's trying to stop and twist and turn, right? So you have all of these things kind of working against the ACL at this particular stage in life, all right? But why the difference between boys and girls? Well, boys have testosterone. So they're starting to, as they're growing, their testosterone is also increasing. So they have an in, uh, increase in muscular power, strength, and coordination, which leads to better neuromuscular control of those larger body dimensions more quickly. And puberty girls don't have that, so it takes them longer to grow in to their new bodies and control it with, with, um, with more precision. So this likely explains the difference. And the fact that there's really no difference between you know, eight-year-old boys and girls in their ACL verse, and then you see this huge discrepancy during puberty, and then it, it, it kind of comes back down, um, strengthens that, that argument. That there's, there's something hormonal going on. And so we go back to that graph, right? So you see the difference. They're about the same, you know, around that, that age of 10, and then they take off as they get to their mid-teens. And then it's really interesting. You get to college level, right? Girls are still up, but they start to drop off after college significantly. And then the boys, the men, right, as they go into their 20s and 30s and, you know, almost into their 40s, stay flat, which means I think that we continue to do stupid things, uh, you know, high-risk things. Um, until we're almost 40, and uh, the girls learned their lesson. They said, no, we're gonna, I'm not going to do that. Um, but I think this is a, a helpful graph to kind of highlight that, that there's a difference between boys and girls, especially during their teenage years. And um, so if you wanted to pick an at-risk group to try to hone in on, to, to try to lower this, um, this you know, epidemic of, uh, of ACL tears, it's really teenage girls. And I can pick out somebody on the soccer field and say that's an ACL waiting to happen because they look like a newborn giraffe. You know, they're tall, they're skinny, they don't have great body control. They're trying to figure it out. And whenever I point it out, you know, that's what the kids look like on the right there. All right, what else can predict an ACL injury? Well, BMI. There have been a number of studies on this. Um, the U.S. military has studied this extensively for obvious reasons because it's a, um, it's a cost for them. So recruits uh, with a standard uh, BMI, a standard deviation higher than average, uh, three and a half times greater risk of an ACL injury. So there's something to be said about controlling that, um, that increased mass and trying to change direction. And then similar findings have been found in um, female soccer players at adolescent age that um, higher BMI was, was a risk factor for ACL. So then we start to get into some of the more anatomic issues. The, so the Q angle is probably somewhat familiar with, um, you know, in, in patellar tracking discussions and things like that. So, so females tend to have a greater Q angle because of the, the width of the pelvis. And so that valgus moment that we talked about, you know, does that put the ACL at higher risk? Just their underlying shape of their knees. Tend, girls tend to be a little bit more valgus. Boys, if anything, tend to be a little bit more varus ultimately. But um, there, there's no definitive study that's linked the two, okay? So uh, I, I can't find a study to point to that says this is, this is definitely a cause. But there's some discussion that, that it, that's associated. Um, and then females tend to have a narrower notch. So if you look at the anatomy of the knee, the end of the femur um, here, that's where the ACL sits. So the ACL lies right in the middle of that notch when the knee is perfectly straight. So when it's fully extended, this area is full with an ACL. 
okay? And so males tend to have a wider notch, so they have more room for a bigger ligament, um, and females tend to have a narrow notch, smaller ligament. So it, it, could that uh, contribute as well? Well, no study's proven it, but, um, but there's certainly interest in that. Um, and, and I'll just mention, it also plays a role in reconstruction because you can't put a huge graft in a small notch. So you have to, you have to kind of tailor that a little bit too. So it has implications beyond that. So ligamentous laxity, I know you guys see this all the time, but the Biden scores or Baden scores, however you want to say it, um, for any resident who doesn't know these probably should know them. I do them all the time. When I have a kid who comes in, shoulder instability, kneecap pops out, uh, ACL tears, right? This is relevant to a lot of the things that I see, right? Does this all look familiar this on the right side? I mean, you know, pull the finger back and the, so, so um, like super simple. I check their, their elbows if they hyperextend, check their knees if they hyperextend, have them pull their pinky back. If they can go past 90 degrees, it's positive. And then the party trick where can you touch your thumb to your forearm, right? Can you push it down and touch your thumb to your forearm? Um, and then the last is if you can put your palms flat with your knees fully extended, right? It's not just flexible, right? That's not just, oh, you're, you're, you're a gymnast, right? That's hyperlaxity, right? So that's, that's beyond, if you can do all of those things, right? And that's by definition um, uh, ligamentously lax. And so we know that the patients who have uh, ligamentous laxity um, have, have a higher rate of ACL tear, right? About almost three times greater risk. Uh, and then if you check all these athletes, they have increased anterior posterior laxity, right? So if you do a Lachman on them and it feels like the ACL is torn even though it's not, they're at a higher risk of an ACL tear. And this is, this is a big one, so neuromuscular control. So it makes sense, right? So the way that you land and how you can stabilize the hip and knee it puts you at a higher risk of an ACL injury. And we know that the, the translation of the tibia can be modified by firing the hamstrings and the quadriceps by about 50 to 75 percent. Okay, so if you co-contract the quadriceps and, and the hamstrings on either side of the knee, you can stabilize the shifting of the tibia relative to the femur significantly. So if you can add that in, if you can make those strong and you can balance out the muscular forces, you can protect the ACL. That's the concept there. And one concept to, kind of, to think about is the relationship between the quadriceps and the hamstrings. So if your quadriceps are stronger, significantly stronger than your hamstrings, they fire first or they fire, fire with, with more strength, what's going to happen? Your knee is going to land straight, right? You're going to have a, a more likelihood of landing in that position that you, you don't want to be in. And so that's, that's one, been one topic of study where um, it seems that a lot of female soccer players tend to be quad dominant. They don't have a lot of, of hamstring contribution. So if you co-contract to try to land or change uh, direction, if the quad is significantly stronger, you're going to end up in relative extension and that ACL is at risk. And then there's some question about fatigue. You know, is, is there, are you more likely to tear your, your ACL at the end of the game, right, fourth quarter, right? Um, those studies have not been conclusive. We haven't been able to link fatigue with ACL injuries, but again, it's, it kind of falls in that category of some common sense. If you're getting lazy and you know um, your quad's really tired or you know worn out, maybe. All right. So, what are the signs and symptoms of an ACL? Acutely, the patient's going to say, "I felt the pop." Not always, but often. Okay. There's going to be uh, obviously significant pain when it happens, and then the knee's going to swell, and that is that. That's the big red flag, right? The patient, you know comes off the field or comes into the office the next day, big balloon knee, then like flag goes up, it's like, okay, you did something. The most likely cause of that, like if you look at all big knee effusions in the pediatric population, ACL is number one, okay, all right? Not, not just swelling for any reason, but after you know, a traumatic event, obviously. Um, and then they'll have difficulty bearing weight on that, that knee, not because of the ACL tear, but because of the effusion. So what you'll find is, and, and this is where the chronic ones become a little bit more tough, right? So once the swelling's down, the kid starts to feel a lot better, right? They're going to go back playing with their siblings. They're going to be running around. They're going to be having fun. Um, they might complain of some looseness, right? They might say, you know, it buckles or gives way or instability. Kids won't usually use those terms. Um, but 
what, what tends to happen is they, they have re-injuries, right? So the knee swells up again. And mom's like, why does your knee keep swelling? That's weird, you know? Um, it, and then that's, that's when you kind of end up finding these if they end up going into that chronic phase. Um, but they, they tend to feel pretty normal after that. So, all right, so how do you test the ACL? All right, this one is the easiest, it's softball. They're all softballs. Um, the Lachman test. McMurray, poster, so we've got some different votes. So let's do, let's do hands, hands are fun. Uh, a, Lachman test, who thinks? Okay, we got a lot of hands. Uh, McMurray, nobody is falling for that one. Posterior drawer, we got a couple, and then valgus stress at 30 degrees, nobody's falling for that one. Okay, so let's run through those. So they're all real tests. Um, Lachman is for the ACL, okay? So most of you guys are on there. McMurray is for meniscus tear, okay? Posterior drawer. PCL, okay, that's the ACL's neighbor. Um, and then valgus stress of 30 degrees is MCL, medial collateral ligament, okay? All right, so if you look at this little, this little video here, it's kind of showing you how you're gonna do your lockman, all right? Do about a 1,000 of these and then it's easy, okay? But until then, it's a real learning curve. I, I really believe that's true because uh, every knee feels a little different. So if you're not sure, test the other side, right? So you always compare side to side. The nice thing about orthopedics, um, you usually have something to compare to. So about 20 degrees, the flexion, you stabilize the femur, and you want to shift that tibia forward. And you're getting a sense for how much translation you get of that tibia relative to the femur. It can be subtle. That's why I think you have to you have to do a lot of these, um, but uh, one of the easier tests, and it's a newer test, and it's really this is really helpful. The lever sign or the Lolly test. I think Dr. Lolly was the one who described this. But um, you essentially you look at A there. You put your hand underneath the calf, close to the knee. Okay, the heel's on the bed. Then you're going to push down above the knee on the thigh. Okay. And if the heel comes off the bed, it's a negative test. That means that the ACL is working, that the tibia is not shifting forward, right? The ACL is locking it down, and you can lift the heel off the bed. In C, it's positive, right? So you're pushing down, and you cannot get that heel to come off the bed. You can't get it to come off the bed because the tibia is shifting forward instead of locking it in and, and levering the, the heel off. Does that make sense? This is a really helpful test. One, because I think it's a little bit uh, less subtle, right? Because it's less of, it feels a little loose, right? And it's more, the heel's not coming out, right? So you have a little bit more of a positive um, affirmation that this is a negative or a positive test. It's not a perfect test, but it's very, very good. Um, it's also really helpful if you have a big leg. So I, I take care of offensive linemen. They weigh 380 pounds. I mean, not, I'm not kidding. I just operate on a guy that's 400 pounds. Um, I can't get my hands around their thighs. Their thighs are bigger than my waist. Again, not a joke. It's, they're huge. Uh, so something like this is, is really helpful to have in, in, in your back pocket. All right. So we've got the history. We know what happened to them. We've got our physical exam. We've done our test. We'll do our x-rays because usually because insurance wants it, but they're usually negative. They don't, they don't show a lot in this instance if it's an isolated ACL. <laughs> Tear. And so we move on to MRI, and that's going to show us all of our soft tissues, um, including the ACL, but we're also interested in what's happening to the cartilage and the menisci and so forth, and the other ligaments, of course. All right, so what's the acute treatment of an ACL tear? I'm not going to make you list them all out, but um, so the kid walks in, big effusion in the knee, you think, gosh, I don't know, maybe you got an uh, ACL tear, we're going to get an MRI. Um, tell them, you know, relax, get some ice on it, we're going to elevate it, give them maybe a little compression with an ACE wrap, just gentle, you don't want to cut off the blood supply and cause, you know, issues distal to it. Um, get them some crutches, get them a brace, knee immobilizer's fine, right? Just help them because the, the effusion there is the biggest problem. So you really want to focus on getting the fluid out of the knee, okay? Don't aspirate it. Um, I don't know if that's, a, if that's a thing. It's going to fill back up in an acute knee usually, and it's painful, kids hate it. I probably don't have to tell you guys to avoid a needle if you can, right? Or the, I got to tell orthopedic surgeons that we're done. We just like, you know, chase everybody with the needle in the office. All right. So who needs an ACL reconstruction? All right. Um, just about every active patient is going to do better with an ACL reconstruction than without. Okay. 
Um, but especially patients who have associated knee injuries, so other ligaments, so multi-ligament injury, MCL, LCL, things like that, meniscus tears, or if they have cartilage injuries, acute cartilage injuries. Um, and then young patients who otherwise have a healthy knee, you're trying to protect it, right? So can you treat it without surgery? This, this is a, a topic of interest, especially in European countries where they're trying to save money, right? Surgery costs more than not surgery, generally speaking. Well, there have been some small cohorts that have shown that, you know, if you can really control the activity of the kid, you know, the kid is just like a math whiz and plays chess and piano, and that's it, right? Then maybe you can get away without an ACL because their whole life is, you know, in one direction. It's straight. They're not trying to juke anybody out getting to piano lessons, right? Um, but the, these are you know, relatively limited studies. They're, you know, 13 patients, 20 patients. Um, and so there's this idea of copers, right? So that maybe there's this population of people that can live without an ACL uh, and, and not really know that their ACL is torn. But the vast majority uh, of studies that we've done show that actually most people do very poorly with non-operatively treated ACL tears. And what we find, especially with younger kids, if you try to treat it non-operatively to figure out who's the coper and who's not, um, a lot of them come back with additional injuries because they're having instability events. And remember we talked about how the meniscus ends up becoming that new bumper, right? So as the tibia shifts, it doesn't have the ACL stop it, so now the next thing to stop it is the meniscus. So they come back with these big, bad meniscus tears uh, or injuries to the cartilage where the knee's banging around because it's loose or other ligament injuries. And so um, it, it, it ends up becoming a problem, a bigger problem. So if you wanted to try to break it down, somebody's asking, well, you know, do I need an ACL or do I not? Well, for activities like walking, jogging in a straight line, working a desk job, riding a bicycle, um, you really don't need an ACL, right? So if somebody's older and they say, look, these are my hobbies, this is what I want to do, you say, yeah, maybe you don't need it. Uh, let's see how you do. We'll try it. But anything, you know, that you can imagine, it requires change of direction, essentially, uh, you really need an ACL for. All right, so we kind of went through this. What are the risks of not getting effects, right? So every time a patient has an instability event the knee gives out on them, there's a risk for all of those other structures. The other ligaments are doing more work, the menisci, the cartilage. And so, well, who cares if those things get damaged, right? You can fix them. Well, sort of, right? There are harder problems to fix, especially articular cartilage. If that goes, that's a harder problem to fix, especially in a young person. Um, and once those structures start to become affected, like the menisci, those shock-absorbing discs in your knee, um, you, you, you start to head down that road of arthritis at, a, at an advanced pace, okay? And then not to mention, every time your knee gives out on you, swells up, you're missing something, right? You were in the middle of something, and now, you know, you have to deal with this again, right? So having an unstable knee or an unreliable knee leads to you know, other, uh, you know, disruptions in life, of course. All right. So what, what do I need before I can fix the knee? Well, I want all the swelling out of the knee. I'd love to see normal motion, right? I really want to have full extension in that knee and at least 90 degrees of flexion, okay? Uh, I'd like to see that their quadriceps is firing, right, so that when there's a lot of fluid in the knee, end up with inhibited quadriceps. Um, so we want to make sure that's getting, that's getting to move. Um, one of the best things you can do potentially for a patient if they come in, big effusion, like I'm pretty sure you have an ACL tear, give them an MRI. Get them into physical therapy. Let them work on getting that effusion out. Start to optimize the knee and getting it moving. Okay. So the indications. So obviously, they have a complete ACL tear with functional instability. They failed non-operative treatment. If that's uh, an option you know, for that potential patient, uh, they have an ACL tear plus a meniscus tear or chondral injury or another ligaments damage. Um, they really shouldn't have any arthritis in the pediatric population. That's really not an issue. Uh, and then I'd like to see restored knee motion. Okay. So the, the, the graft conversation. We don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but if anybody's interested, I mean, I've got, we've got data here. <laughs> so there are really three graphs, three autographs, right? So the patients like to know, you know which graft is the best graft. There's patella tendon, so that's bone, patella tendon, bone, right? So that's because there's bone on each side of it apart from the patella, apart from the tibia, okay? Um, biggest incision tends to be the most painful. Uh, hamstring, okay? Uh, classically, we took both the semitendinosus and the gracilis, so two hamstrings. Tends to be a less painful, smaller incision. 
than patella tendon. And this was always the pediatric option because you're not disrupting the growth plates. It's a soft tissue graft. It's not a bony graft. The last thing you want to do is put, put a piece of bone that's going to fuse across the growth plate and potentially, you know, inhibit growth. So you, you want a soft tissue only graft. And that's what, that was always hamstring. And a quadriceps is, is the new horse in the race. It's actually my favorite. And so um, and I'll, I'll tell you why. But um, so quad tendon historically was used, like 40 years ago, had terrible outcomes. And so we basically shelved it. But now with newer technology for fixation, um, it's really started to come back um, with a vengeance. So, and then there's allograft, which shouldn't really come up in your line of work, okay? If anybody's doing an allograft ACL, on a pediatric, right? So anybody 18 or younger, really 40 or younger in my in my book, but especially for you guys, you see someone comes back with with a allograft, you still should raise some red flags, all right? Because we know we've done studies on this. Um, pediatric population with an allograft have a much higher risk of failure of that graft. Uh, it just doesn't last. Um, I mean, not all of them fail, but it's significantly higher. All right. <clears throat> But if, if you somehow the, the patients had you know, their patella tendon and then they failed it and they had a hamstring and they failed it and they had a quad and they failed it, you know, then maybe I guess you could argue. But even then, I'd probably go to the opposite knee and harvest from there. All right. So we know about allograft, significantly less likely to, to restore normal stability, okay? Laxity is three times greater than autograft, all right, once it's, once it's healed. Um, significantly higher failure rate compared to autograft in those under 40. Um, but anybody over 40, it doesn't seem to be a big difference. So it's a good option if, if you have somebody who's 40, 50, you know, and, uh, and needs an ACL, but they don't want to go through, you know, the, the pain of the harvest, you know, of, of taking that, that graft from somewhere else in their knee. It's a little less painful. It's a little bit quicker rehab initially. Um, so if any of the older attendings ever have an ACL, out, don't, don't scare away from allograft. It's a great option, um, uh, you know, when you're, when you're, past that point in life, all right? So these are the graphs we're talking about. You have the hamstring all the way on your left there, and then the patella tendon in the middle, and then quadriceps on the right, okay? All right, so hamstring's good and bad. It's relatively quick. It's a pretty reliable graph, small incisions. Uh, it's rare to have chronic pain at the harvest site, um, but the, the downside of this is um, it's really hard to cover this with a nerve block. So the nerve blocks that we do numb up the saphenous nerve. And the saphenous nerve, if you remember, kind of covers the anterior and medial side of the knee. But it doesn't get to the posterior aspect where those hamstrings are. And it's all the way up the thigh. So if you watch the way we harvest it, I mean, we strip all the way up, you know, <coughs> close to the groin to, to, get, to, to get that tendon free. Um, and so patients do tend to have, have pain back there when they wake up. It's just really hard to numb all the way up the back of the thigh. Um, so acute hamstring discomfort. That goes away, obviously, but, um, but it's, uh, it's painful at first, and it's, it's hard to get away from that. Uh, the graph's initially weaker than BTB. Um, the fixation to bone, so having it ingrow to the bone can take longer than, than the patella tendon. It stretches out a little bit more than the patella tendon. The graph size is not as predictable. So you don't know what you're going to get until you get them out, and then you, you know, wrap them up to whatever, you know, you're going to do with your graph. Uh, you, you don't know what what size the ACL is going to be, and that's to me that's the biggest downside of it. Because you come out and you have a seven millimeter graph, which is not good. I mean, it's, we know that if you if you want to lower your risk for re tear, it needs to be eight millimeters in diameter or greater. And so uh, the hamstring is a little bit of a roll of the dice. You don't really know what you're going to get with a BTB. You, you cut the graph that you want. You measure it, you cut it. You know what you're getting. Uh, same thing with the quadriceps. Um, and then there's some question about hamstring weakness. Uh, so historically, we've, we've harvested both the gracilis and the SMIT because you want to have this long graft. And I'll go into that a little bit about why that was. But newer techniques um, have led us to be able to use just the semitendinosis. And so I actually had this idea in fellowship. I said, well, you know, does it make a difference? It, should we be really pushing to say, let's save the gracilis? And so we did a study to see, you know, I had, I had one attending who, who did it the kind of the classic way, harvested both, and I had another attending who was just doing the semi-tendinosis harvest. And so I took those patient populations, compared them, um, and what we found is that um, 
the patients who had both the SMIT and the gracilis harvested did have significantly weaker flexion than those when we just took the semitendinosus, but it was most significant in deep flexion, so beyond 90 degrees, so that point where, you know, I tell, I tell kids, you know, if you want to kick yourself in the butt, right, that's, um, that, that's where you'd, you'd notice the most weakness. But it, it can be relevant for gymnasts and, um, you know, uh, cheerleaders, dancers, things like that, right? They can't get that, that deep flexion, get the heels up. It's relevant. So, um, so that, that, that's what we found in that study, and, and um, the one attending did, did start to change his, his practice. Um, so the patella tendon, so the BTB, good and bad. So bone heals quickly to bone, right? So that's, that's the nicest thing about it, I think. It's the best thing it's got going for it, is that you've got these bone plugs in the tunnels that will heal the bone. Uh, it should heal faster than soft tissue to bone, okay? It tends to be a stiffer graft in the hamstrings. You don't have any issues with deflection, right? So no hamstring problems like that. And uh, historically, it's been used for collision sports with so football, um, a lot of times for female soccer players, uh, ligamentously lax individuals, the hamstrings tend to stretch out a little bit more. Um, if they have a history of hamstring injuries, or sometimes you know, the hamstrings are actually damaged when the ACL is damaged, that can happen, especially if it's an ACL, MCL type, um, type chair. And I think this is still considered the gold standard, right? You say, look, just give me the Cadillac graph, right? So it's, the BTB has been used for 40 years, and... Um, has been kind of the workhorse of ACL reconstruction, okay? But the downside, so anterior knee pain, it's not insignificant, so harvest site pain. You're taking a piece of the patella or taking a piece of the, of the tibia, and that can be painful with, with kneeling on, okay? It's a big incision. There's really not a great way to do this, you know, minimally invasively, so you have this big scar on the front of the knee. Um, and when it scars down, right, so this goes to heal, so you take this piece out, and then this goes to heal. So you can imagine the sides kind of heal together, and what does that do? It relatively shortens that distance. And what does that do? Well, that puts a little bit more pressure, just a little bit, right, between the kneecap and the femur. So that articular, that articulating surface between the patella and the femur, so you're increasing the pressure points um, and, and creating what we call relative um, patella baja, right? So it's lower than it should be. That connection's tighter. And so that puts them at a higher risk for patella femoral arthritis. So about 25% of these who have BTB will actually come back in their 40s and 50s with some significant patella femoral arthritis. Um, and then uh, there's a little bit more pain associated with it because we have to take the pieces of bone. Um, and there's risk for patella fracture. I actually had a partner who, you know, found out the, pa the patient got up to go home after the surgery, took their first step, boom, patella fracture. They put them back to sleep, took them back to the operating room, fixed it for the time. Yeah. So it's a, it happens. All right. So what does the literature tell us about it? Well, if you look at all of the things that we care about, about graphs, I'm not going to, like, this is like death by, you know, PowerPoint right now. Um, so essentially there, there are pros to, to patella tendon, there are pros to hamstring tendons, okay? And then what we know is that their re-rupture rate are essentially same, same. If you look at everybody across the board, patella tendon, hamstring tendon, it's not like there's a huge failure of hamstring tendons and everybody should get patella tendon. So they're all on the board. Every, you know, you got some guys who love to do hamstring, some guys who love to do patella tendon, but most of us will kind of pick and choose depending on, you know, the different athletes and, you know, specific things about them. Um, and then plenty of patients have their own opinions or dad usually has, an, you know, dad has, has, you know, the perfect graft in mind. Um, so what about the quad tendon? So this is, the, here it is. Uh, it's, a, it's a very strong graft. Um, I initially started using it for revision. So when I ran out of patella tendons to use, I ran out of hamstrings to use because they've already had both. Um, I said, well, okay, well, I, I got to go somewhere. So I went to the quad, and that's where I started using it in my practice. But it's really gotten very popular in the past five years. Um, it seems to have less, less morbidity, um, so it's less painful. They heal it up better. It, I, I, I've learned to do it in a, with a really tiny incision. I think you know, relatively tiny um, compared to the other incisions. Um, my my biggest concern with it was is the quad going to be weak? Right, I'm taking part of the tendon. It hasn't been a problem. These patients tend to rehab faster than than patella tendon. Um, what about anterior knee pains? You're going to hurt from the quad. You know, the harvest site again. It just seems to heal up so well. That hasn't been a problem. Um, and really, all the best, you know, all the most recent data coming out about this shows that it's an excellent, excellent choice. And so, most of my patients these days are actually getting quad tendon grafts. All right. So, all the studies that have been done show that it's equal outcomes, if not better outcomes, than hamstring with less morbidity. And the same thing for quadriceps. 
well, it, uh, at least um, functional outcomes are at least as, as good, if not better, uh, with less morbidity than patella tendon. So this is where I'm steering a lot of my patients. All right, so is everybody still with me? All right. Um, so the first thing we'll do, you know, you know that you have ACL tear. The first thing I'll do in the operating room is harvest. So it's either a hamstring graft or, you know, the patella tendon or, or the quad like we were talking about. Once you get your graft out, you usually have my, my assistant, my PA, uh, prepare this on the back table. This is what my hamstring grafts look like, okay, when, when they're done. It's, it's folded over four times on itself and then stitched together to make a, a, a really strong uh, graft that needs to be a you know, specific size and length to fit the bone tunnels that I'm going to create. Um, then I move on to the arthroscopy, look at everything inside the knee, so I do a diagnostic arthroscopy, confirm the MRI didn't miss anything. That's what a normal ACL looks like on the left. That is what an abnormal ACL looks like on the right. Can you tell the difference? This is orthopedics, it's easy, right? Um, I fix everything else that needs to be fixed, right? So torn meniscus on the left side, a fixed meniscus, repaired meniscus on the right side, right? So we stitch that back together. Um, and that's, that's a whole other topic, and so meniscus tears, that's, that's, a, that's a whole other thing, all right? Um, and then we have to create a home. We have to create sockets for the new graft to heal into, okay? So we drill into the femur and drill into the tibia, and there are different ways to do that, okay? Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the big topics, have you guys ever heard of a double bundle ACL? You ever heard of that? Okay, all right. Now I'm not going to go into it, but... That was a very popular thing in orthopedics for about two decades. It was popularized by um, one of the surgeons at, at University of Pittsburgh. But um, we knew that there are two, two bundles to the ACL, and so the thought was, well, let's reconstruct each one of them individually. And the thought was that it would actually be better, but it really didn't pan out at all. Um, and so we don't – some guys maybe are still doing this, but um, that they, they will be gone soon. So um, classically, when we drill these tunnels – Look at the green line on the left there, okay? So that green line represents what we call transtibial tunnels. So what we used to do is you drill up through the tibia where you want the ACL to be. And then you just keep drilling all the way into the femur. And that would just be, that's where your, that's where your femoral tunnel would be. And so guys who are really good at this, and some guys still do this, but um, guys who are really good know exactly where they're going to come out and exactly where they're going to go in, and they end up putting the ACL on the femoral side in a pretty good position. But inevitably, it ends up being very vertical, right? It has to be because your drill is straight. So you end up with this trajectory straight up through the femur. And what we found is that that's not anatomical, right? That, do, that, that doesn't recreate the normal trajectory of the ACL. The ACL connects to that sidewall of the femur. So if you look at the blue line, and that's really what we've moved to now. So we actually drill at a flatter angle to try to recreate the anatomic footprint of the ACL, okay? So we're really trying to get back to... Uh, the normal anatomy, all right? And so we, and we've definitely found that this is a technical failure point, right? So vertical tunnels tend to lead to less rotational stability and, um, and ACL failure, okay? All right, so then we pass the graft uh, through the tunnels, and then we have to fix it. Well, how do we fix it? Well, classically, we use screws, interference screws, right? So just like that picture shows, right, you have the graft up in the tunnels, and you have screws that wedge in between the graft and the bone tunnel. And this is still how most patella tendons are done. And this is probably why the quad tendons failed, because there wasn't, there wasn't bone to fix, right? There wasn't something to really get a good bite for those screws. And so it failed. And so everybody said, well, you know, it's a terrible graft, right? But we didn't fix it correctly. Um, and that's the difference. All right, so now we have kind of this newer technology. And this is what I do for everything. I even do my patella tendons this way. So even with bone plugs, I'll, I'll use suspensory fixation. So, so what, is that, what are we talking about? So it's just like a button on your shirt, okay? It's a titanium button here and here. It has suture that, that goes over the button, just like on your shirt, and it's tied into the graft on both ends. So I, I create a socket in the bone, so I drill in, and then this is, we call it a flip cutter, but basically what it means is it's a, it's a drill that you, you drill uh, retro, retroactively. Um, so I have a video of it. I kind of try to show you how it works. But you drill in, and then you flip it, and then you, you kind of uh, drill backwards to create a socket from inside out, okay? So you can create a socket however deep you want, and, it just, and you base it essentially on the length of your 
graph. All right, so I create a socket that fits that graph, but I don't have a socket here. Does that make sense? I just have a tiny little tunnel where the sutures can go through to get to the button. And then, so then the button suspends it from the cortex, very strong, okay? And then we have a self-tensioning suture system. It's kind of like, um, you remember a Chinese finger trap? You put your fingers in and you try to pull them out, it would, it would tighten. It works the same way. It's one suture slides inside the other, and we try to pull that suture out, it locks down on it, tightens up. So we use the same thing to, to have this kind of self-tensioning um, suture system. The only downside is once it's tight, it's tight. So you better be sure that when you tighten it down, that's where you want it. Okay. Um, let's see, how much time do we have? Do you guys want to see a surgical video? Nods? I'm getting some nods. Let's see if it's still, still open here. It is. Okay. All right, so I'm just going to narrate this. I'm going to turn off the... Um, so I've created, I've already created, this is the femoral socket, all right? So I've already created that. Now I'm passing a suture into that socket. So that's in the femur. We're in the notch of the femur, right? So where that ACL used to live is right in front of us, okay? There's no more ACL. The PCL is right to our left. All right. So now this is what the flip cutter looks like. I'm going to just go back just real quick. So you, what you'll see is, um, so it, see, it, it came in straight. Now I'm flipping that blade down. And I'm going to flip it down to the size right there. See how it flipped down like that? I'm flipping that down. That's the exact diameter of the socket that I want. It's really the, I guess it would be the radius, right? Because as it spins, it's going to create the diameter, right? Um, so that's, and you can see here, this is all, that's all ACL remnant. So I'm going to put this right in the middle of the ACL footprint. And so <clears throat> we can get this thing going. That'd be great. All right, here it goes. Um, so it's drilling, and I'm pulling back, and I'm basically reaming out a socket of bone down into the tibia. All right, and I'm only going to do as much as I need, and that's based on the length of graft that I have. This is all bone fragments, so I'm going to come in here and, and shave out all these little bone fragments and everything. Um, and that's where I and the shaver there. So you can see that's what it looks like when the blade is flipped up, right? So it's, you know, like a kind of like a standard drill before you flip it down. I'm going to get all this soft tissue out of the way and make it easy for me to get my graft in there. And so you can see that socket right down there. All right, I'm going to move on a little bit. So there's our socket, and here I am bringing in another suture here, another passing suture. And these are the sutures that I'm going to use here. So here and here to pass my graph in. All right, here we go. So now I'm starting to pass the, the sutures that are attached to the ACL graph. I'm starting to bring it in. Let's see, if I, yep, and there's the button. So this is the button that's going to be flipped on the cortex of the femur. That's going up into that femoral socket. I'm going to come out, and I'm just going to pop in the other side of the knee. I've got two portals in the front of the knee. I like this one because I can actually see up the socket here, and I like to watch the button go past the cortex of the femur. All right, so I'm trying to get in a position to do that. So now you can see here's the button. Here's the socket that's been created, and here's that see, you know, I only created it to this depth, and now you can see this tiny hole. That's where the, the drill came in initially. I like to leave that, you know, a good amount of that intact because that's what the button is going to rely on, good solid bone there. Um, to, to, to stay attached, okay? So now I've got it through. I'm going to flip. I have a, 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 a different colored suture on there that I use to flip the button from, from, you know, kind of vertical to perpendicular to the cortex, and then we're going to pull it back down. We'll test the integrity of it, and then let's see. So we're happy there. It looks good, and then I'm going to start to bring that graft in. So here's the, the new ACL. The purple on there is marks from, from my PA uh, to tell me the depth. So I, kn I know how much I want in this socket and how much I want in the other socket. Okay. So now we start to get that seated, and then we're going to move on to our tibial side and getting that ready, getting all the sutures ready, and then it's, we're going to pass it in. So there, we've dunked it down. So here's the new ACL. All right. That's the dunk down into the tibia, I'm gonna, and then I'm going to put a new button on the tibial side. And the femoral button's already done. So then here we're just going to tighten up uh, the graft on each side, kind of center it inside the knee, make sure we like it. Then I extend the knee and make sure that it fits inside that notch. Remember we talked about how narrow that notch is and how you want to have a graft that, that fits uh, perfectly inside. And so that's with the knee fully extending. You can see how it fits right inside that femoral notch and is not crowding the PCL over here and is essentially anatomically recreated their, their ACL. Okay. All right. See, it's easy. It's easy. All right. Now I've got all these topics from you know the, all these hot topics, but that starts to get into some other things. So um, 
We've got about 10 minutes left, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open it up to questions, and I'm going to go to my question slide, because this is like, if you thought that was death by PowerPoint, you should see this, these next things. Oh, it's terrible. Um, right to here. Oh, there we go. Pediatrics. Those are my kids. So, um, any questions? If there aren't any questions, we can go early, or I can go back and talk to you about some of those other things. Yes, please. So, when we have a patient like this, we refer them obviously. What, what should we be telling the patient? Yeah. It's really about the rehab part. I have some personal experience with this. Yes. And that's, that's significant. Yes. And, and helping them to understand this is not a quick fit. So, what, yeah. what do you guys say ahead of time? So, due to time constraints, but I can kind of move through this. But um, this, is, this is a helpful kind of timeline to get our heads around. Okay, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer it indirectly and I'm going to answer it directly. Okay, uh, really two years, that's what we know, that's what it takes to recover fully from an ACL injury. Two years is crazy to say that you can't play soccer, you can't play football, you can't be a gymnast, right? Two years is crazy. Right? Historically, we've always said six months, that's been the number. And that's because professional athletes we, we found can get back in about six months. So we just extrapolated that out and said, well, everybody should be able to do that. But obviously not everybody should be able to do that because professional athletes are genetic freaks. That's the first thing. And then the second is they have all the resources in the world, generally speaking, right? Everybody has all the interest in the world of them getting back as soon as possible. High school athletes you know, don't, don't have all of those things going for them. And so what we found is that um, it's really 9 to 12 months. So 9 to 12 months is the new return to play window especially for soccer, football, right, so the, the high-risk sports. In 9 to 12 months, we know because if you, if, you, if you look at all the data we have, if you go back at six months, your risk for a, another injury to the ACL, either that ACL or the other ACL, either one, is almost 25%, one of four. That's a lot, right? I, most people would not take that risk. Um, you wait till nine months, it cuts in half. Right, so it goes down to somewhere around 10, 12 percent. Right, that's a little bit more powerful. Okay, maybe you wait for 12 months, goes down to somewhere around 6 percent, 5, 6 percent. Okay, so now we're getting down to like, okay, this is pretty reasonable. If you wait two years to go back, it goes way down. It goes down to like 2 percent, 3 percent. Right, and it has to do with all of these other things that are going on listed up there. Right, so you have these bone bruises. Right, just the impact from from being hit. Those take you know months, over a year, a lot of times to fully resolved, their proprioception that was within that ligament is gone, right? We don't have a way to recreate that. So the nerve endings in the ligament that, that give that, that feedback is gone. Um, how long it takes for that graft that we put in to turn into a real ligament, right? Um, it takes more than a year. You get the back their their neuromuscular control, their landing mechanics, right? Going back to that athletic stance. Um, and controlling their body correctly, right? That takes time, and then the knee strength, right? And so those are all things that we're interested in measuring. Um, but to answer your questions, the, the, the easiest way to, to kind of approach that topic is to say, listen, you know, um, you're not going to be able to play your sport until your ACL, until you have a new ACL. Once you have a new ACL, the, the, the clock stops and starts, okay? And that, that clock is going to run until you meet all of the return to play criteria, okay? And so I created a return to play criteria uh, protocol for Carillion. Uh, and so all of my athletes have to pass this before I let them go back to playing sports. Um, but as far as time, uh, the timeline, the expected timeline is somewhere between 9 and 12 months. And that's true largely because you want to try to get that, that patient back to the next season, right? So that ends up being, you know, injury in season, that's the most common. And you say, listen, we're going to get this done, and we're going to get you rehab, and you're going to really work on this in the off season. You're going to be better than you ever were for, for when the next season starts. And that usually gives you about nine months, depending on where in the season that injury occurred. Okay, so nine to 12 months is, is the, uh, the expected return. Okay, and in all of this, this is, this is what I have my, my trainers um, or strength and conditioning coaches run them through. To, uh, to try to get them ready. And we actually have a partnership with uh, a place called Lab Sports, okay? And so this is probably worth knowing about. It's not far away. Um, it's uh, kind of I'm trying to think how to describe it, but it's near, the, it's near RMH. 
and uh, it, it's it's an athletic facility. They have a lot of indoor fields, um, so your kids may end up you know playing indoor soccer there, or, you know indoor lacrosse, things like that. But um, they have about half a dozen strength and conditioning coaches, and what they've found is this niche of return to play. So a lot of uh, my athletes. When they're done with physical therapy and they, you know, they, they feel like they're ready to go, so six months has gone by and they're like, okay, what do I do next? It's like, okay, I send them over to lab sports and these guys pick up where the therapy leaves off and gets them ready to play. So it's strength and conditioning, working on their neuromuscular control, their balance, their you know, plyometrics, their, their landing mechanics, uh, all of those things they start to hone in on and they, and they use these, this protocol to try to figure out where they are and, and what they're ready for. And so not everybody's ready to go at, at a year out. You know, some people just take longer. They don't put in the work, whatever it is. And so there, sometimes we have to have that conversation. Like, look, you're just not passing. You know, it's a good question. Does that help? Does that does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, I think. Was uh, that too was that too broad? Well, yeah, I think the message. You know, I don't know, it takes a long while. And, and, you know, some people. I mean, in today's world. People want a quick fix. Hundred percent. And the surgery is the beginning. Yes. Only all that other stuff. So yeah. Yeah. So getting that, how do you get that across? Uh, you know, um, and, and and how much of a conversation you want to have in that instance, I don't know, but um, uh, I think the easiest thing to say is, you know, look, it, you know, it's torn. You're going to need surgery, and it's going to be a full year before you're going to get back to the full go. I, that's like that's the that's the simplest sound bite that I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, he was he was quicker on the draw. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I guess I have two related questions. One, where along the original ligament is like the failure point? Like where did failure most likely happen? Yeah. And then in each type of repair, um, if you do repair it, does that depend on like if you have a longer ligament or if it's done more frequently, is that less likely to repair? Good question. So, so you can imagine. I mean, the ACL has been studied, you know, top to bottom, back. I mean, it's like hard to imagine a, a study that hasn't been done. Um, so the ligament tears, tends to tear mid-substance or off the femur. Those are the most common. Now, in pediatric populations, sometimes you get the, the spine avulsions. You guys have all seen those. You know, that's where the growth plate fails, where the, the you know, typically the ACL would have failed, right? So that, that's a little bit of an exception, but a kind of, you know, a different topic. Um, as far as where the grafts fail, their failure point uh, tends to be the same as for the original ACL. So it tends to fail at the femoral attachment or mid-substance. Um, as far as you know, weak points in, in the graft, I mean, we try to design the grafts so that they're uniform and that there isn't, there isn't like a more narrow part or a thicker part or anything like that. We try to keep it uniform. But as I had hinted at before, we know the grafts that are less than eight millimeters in diameter are significantly higher risk for failure. We know that there have, there's a certain structural, um, you know, uh, just amount of collagen that you have to have um, to withstand the forces. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Sure. Do you do any kind of imaging to follow the progress of the Excellent question. Really good question. Um, generally, no. Um, there are definitely series, uh, you know, for, for research where we, you know, we want to hone in on, you know, what stage are we, you know, as, as the graft revascularized, has it grown into the bone, has it done this, that, and that, the other thing. Um, but no, so unless there is, um, unless there are red flags, the patient has instability, um, has another, you know, traumatic event, has recurrent effusions, or just really can't get back to normal, or, or sometimes they keep having pain. Um, then we'll get an MRI. But generally speaking, the patients tend to do to do pretty well, and you just you base it on clinical findings and um, you know, just how they're doing clinically. But um, yeah, it's a really good question. It's hard to justify the cost of an MRI um, in, in instances where patients are doing really really well. And it's a really good question. Question from the pediatric brain. We spent most of our time talking about prevention. Yes. It seems like the surgery we talk about hamstring, hamstring, hamstring. Yeah. I've heard now talk about blue heel strength being more important. Yeah. So how do we come to our families who want to prevent the ACL injuries? 
Beautiful question. I love it. All right. Yes. So such a, such a hot topic. Neuromuscular training programs, right? Can we retrain uh, these? A lot of times, you know, children to to prevent this injury. So I'm not going to go through all this, but the most effective intervention. So what we found, all the studies that we've done on this, who should we target? We need to target adolescent female soccer players, right? They're the most at risk, and they respond the best to this type of training. So you put them through a pre and in season. So you've got to do both. So you have to you have to get them started on this program before the soccer season starts, and you have to keep doing a maintenance program through the season, or else they'll fall off and they start to fall back into that high risk category. All right, you want to focus on plyometrics, right? So that's jumping and landing. Okay, so their landing dynamics, their balance, strength. It has to be all of those things. And we found that if you if you're missing one of those pillars, then it's not nearly as effective as if you have all of them. Okay, so uh, the lab sports does uh, does this as well. So they'll actually even do classes for like ACL prevention. Um, and so if if there's one thing that you want to just be, you know, female soccer player that say she's going to play soccer this year, we're really, really excited, and you say, oh, you know, have, has she done, you know, the the um, the kind of preseason ACL prevention programs, and they say no. The easiest thing to do, okay, is to, to look up FIFA 11. You know this? You know about that? Yeah. So FIFA 11, so anybody who doesn't know about it, uh, was kind of one of the original um, ACL prevention, uh, injury prevention programs. Um, it was sponsored by you know, the soccer league. And so that that kind of hits all of the all of the points here, okay? So the easiest thing would be to just say have like a FIFA 11 program on a sheet that you can just hand them and say, do that, and maybe get some some information on the lab sports place if somebody really wants to, you know, has either had an ACL tear before or, you know, um, mom and dad both had ACL tears and it seems to run the family, right, whatever. Um, you might want to send them over there for you know, a little bit more of a professional level intervention. Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of interest in prevention, especially in that high risk group that we talked about. That's a good question. Do we cover it all? Experts. All right, perfect. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.